So for those of you who are writing already what's on the board, you can keep writing, but I wanna walk through some of what's up here while you're doing that. If you're not writing, don't worry about it. This is, again, just like everything else, this is for your benefit, and if you feel like, well, it's not that helpful to me, then don't worry about it all that much. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanna start by just briefly going over the resources that I've used for this study, because um, I like to give credit where credit is due. Um, so I've obviously been reading from the Holy Bible uh, throughout this series. In particular, I've been using the NIV quite a bit, um, but I do use the Access Bible, which is in the New Revised Standard Version. Um, and what's cool about the Access Bible is it has some really neat notes in it uh, regarding all sorts of things within the biblical text. And the essays at the beginning of biblical books in the Access Bible are really helpful for setting up the structure of the biblical book as a whole. And then my primary commentary that I have been using is this one. It's called Mark from the New Beacon Bible Commentary series. My friend Pat actually has the old Beacon Bible commentary with her. Um, so similar perspectives, but certainly different notes between what Pat has and what I have in these commentaries. Yeah. And his, I, I was been reading, and then there's another one too, this uh, a scholar's Bible for this is an NIV. Uh huh. I've got all of those. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Yeah, any sorts of study Bibles that you can find are always helpful because they'll always have great notes in them to help you understand what's happening. Now, it's worthwhile to mention that they all come from different perspectives. So some of those perspectives are a little bit different than what you have heard in this class from me, and that's okay. That's, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, it's good to have all sorts of different perspectives. Um, so just be aware that if you have a study Bible and there are notes in there that are different than what I said, that doesn't make me wrong. It doesn't make them wrong. doesn't make me right. doesn't make them right necessarily. Uh, we can have multiple perspectives. In fact, I hope that's something that you have been seeing throughout our time together. There are lots of times where we can hold multiple views on one piece of the literature, one passage, one verse, one chapter, all at the same time. So anyway, New Beacon Bible Commentary um, has been a really helpful resource for me that I've used a lot. Um, when I have all these words that I tell you about in Greek, most of that comes from BibleHub.com. There's a lot of resources on BibleHub.com, so that's definitely worth checking out. Um, in particular, I was reading from the Greek for those word studies, but they also have many commentaries on there that you can access for free. Um, so it is a really helpful resource. Go for it, yeah. Yep, others have already done so, yeah. And then the Bible Project, as I've already mentioned before, I can't speak highly enough of the work that they are doing to help people understand what's going on in the Bible. Um, Lori mentioned uh, when I came in earlier that they just came out with a video on dragons, which there are dragons in the Bible, and it's a, and it's a deep biblical theme of the Bible, actually. Um, and they represent chaos. You can, you can go watch the video all on your own. Um, but there's lots of great resources from the Bible Project. And then one other resource that I listed in blue is a resource that I haven't actually used in this class. However, I would highly recommend it for your personal use. It's called Mark for Everyone. It's a part of a series of books uh, called the For Everyone series by N.T. or Tom Right, um, he it's essentially a commentary, but it also has questions for personal reflection or even group study. Um, but it's written at a, a level that's really understandable for everybody, um, and he includes in it his own personal translation of biblical books, so including Mark. 
Um, it's a really good translation along with great study notes. In fact, anything by N.T. Wright is worthwhile. Um, very, very prolific and maybe the most important and significant New Testament scholar of our time. Um, so check out Mark for everyone if you're looking for more resources for Mark or any New Testament book. And then the Old Testament books in that same series are written by John Goldingay, who, like N.T. Wright, is one of the most prolific and important biblical scholars of our time. Um, but he focuses on the Old Testament. So all of those resources are really worthwhile. So definitely check those out. All right, from resources, I want to shift over to the structure of Mark. As we've been going throughout our series, I have been trying and mostly failing to follow this pattern. Uh, so I wanted to show you the structure as I laid it out, and, and I had some help from uh, some, some resources that I found in putting together this structure. And one of the reasons I want to show you this structure is that I want you to see the major themes and motifs of Mark. Obviously, we've been trying to hit, hit on them as we have been going throughout our series, but sometimes it's helpful just to have it all on one spot there for us to see. So we can really break the whole book down into three large sections, and within those large sections, there are subsections underneath. So the first big section is about Jesus announcing the kingdom. So that's chapter 1, verse 1 through chapter 21 of verse 8. Second section are the death predictions, and then there are three of them. Um, and so that's organized in chapters 8, 22 through 10, 52. And then the end of the book, the last five chapters, is Jesus, the suffering servant king, uh, which we're obviously working our way through right now and are going to wrap up tonight. So within those three larger sections, you have these subsections within them. So in the announcing of the kingdom, we have this introduction of Jesus as the new king, as I have been doing every single week that we get together and I do a recap. I keep coming back to Mark 1, verse 1, where Mark tells us this is about Jesus, who is the king. In the second section, the new kingdom, there's a lot of stories in there about what this kingdom looks like. This is the section where Jesus sends out his disciples and his calling disciples. There's also some healing stories there. And then that continues in the third section where it's more about the order of this kingdom. How does all of it fit together? What's the structure that Jesus is setting up in this? More teaching in, in this section especially. So the parables are here in that particular section and that leads into the death predictions and the death predictions notice are bookended by the healing of the blind men which we talked about when we were in that section but again kind of helpful to see it here as you have the um, those two healing stories and then within those death predictions there are stories related to Jesus predicting his death um, so you have a cycle of stories from 827 to 929, and then he makes a second prediction, and then a cycle of more stories, and then third um, in 1032 through verse 45. And then that leads into the final section where Jesus enters into Jerusalem, the triumphant entry in chapter 11. He is announced as king. And then uh, as lawgiver, this is where a lot of the friction between the religious leaders was happening because Jesus is essentially announcing a new way to live out and interpret the law that God gave to the Israelites and by extension all of humanity. And then chapter 13, where Jesus predicted the fall of the temple, we looked at that last week, and the end of the age or the end times. Um, and then we went through chapter 14 last week, uh, where we begin to see the, the events leading up to Jesus' crucifixion. Um, and that's where we find ourselves today in chapter 15. Um, so as we jump into the text, I actually want to start by a word of prayer. 
and then we will get into the narrative of Mark 15 and 16. Father, once again, we gather in your name and in your presence, and we seek to more fully understand who you are in the person of Jesus and what that means for us. And so, God, one more time, as we gather in this space, would you illuminate our minds and our hearts? Um, would you help us to understand? Um, and so, God, be with us, be with our conversation, and we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Mark 15. I'm going to start by reading the first 15 verses. Also, typically, I, I spend a little bit of the time at the beginning doing some behind the text, the world behind the text things. Um, tonight, I'm going to sprinkle that into uh, what we cover within the text. It just kind of worked itself out that way, and I think you'll see why as we go along. Chapter 15. Very early in the morning, the chief priests with the elders, the teachers of the law, and the whole Sanhedrin made their plans. So they bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Are you the king of the Jews? asked Pilate. You have said so, Jesus replied. The chief priests accused him of many things. So again, Pilate asked him, aren't you going to answer? See how many things they are accusing you of. But Jesus still made no reply, and Pilate was amazed. Now it was the custom at the festival to release a prisoner whom the people requested. A man called Barabbas was in prison with the insurrectionists who had committed murder in the uprising. The crowd came up and asked Pilate to do for them what he usually did. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? asked Pilate, knowing it was out of self-interest that the chief priests had handed Jesus over to him. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have Pilate release Barabbas instead. What shall I do then with the one you call the king of the Jews? Pilate asked them. Crucify him, they shouted. Why? What crime has he committed? asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, crucify him. Wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. He had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. All right, so this passage comes right on the heels of Peter disowning Jesus at the end of chapter 14, um, and it's in the midst of a, a trial, essentially, before the Jewish leaders. And in the midst of this trial, the the leaders, the chief priests, the elders, the teachers of the law, they get together and decide he is guilty. Um, so in verse 1, that, that when it says they made their plans, they, they have decided, yep, he's guilty. We're going to hand him over to our Roman prefect, Pilate, for punishment. Now, I should have thought about this earlier. I ran out of space. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So, um, we get introduced to Pilate in verse 2. He's the what they call the prefect or a, a governor. Essentially, he's the, the military leader in Judea at the time that Rome has assigned for this area. Judea being rife with uh, folks who want to commit insurrections, as we see within this passage. Uh, they decide they need to put a really strong military leader and have a strong military presence there uh, so that they can squash any sort of uprisings before they begin. Um, so the Jewish leaders hand 
Jesus over to Pilate in the hopes that Pilate will go along with their plans to get rid of him. Um, So in this second verse, Pilate's first question, are you the king of the Jews? It's a little bit uh, tongue-in-cheek, sarcastic from Pilate, but from Mark's point of view is ironic. So Pilate is like, (laughs) are you the king of the Jews? Uh, Knowing full well that at least from the Jewish leader perspective, that he is not. Even though for us, as Mark's readers, Mark has been very clear that, yes, he is. So Mark is using this as uh, an irony uh, to help us to see that, yes, he is the king of the Jews, despite the fact that uh, Pilate and everyone else who's a character in the story, with the exception of Jesus and a few others, think that he is not. So uh, he's questioning them. Chief priests accuse him of more stuff. Pilate keeps questioning him. He refuses to answer. Um, So he's essentially acquiescing to what is going on. And then in verse 6, we learn of this custom uh, at the festival to release a prisoner that the people request. And we learn about a man named Barabbas. And Mark doesn't give us a whole lot of detail about Barabbas. Other Gospels do a little bit more of that. But just from the name, uh, we can deduce some of what Mark wants us to see in Barabbas. Uh, His name literally means son of the father. Um, So when you are reading through the Bible and you see a name in the New Testament, especially that begins with bar, that usually means son. And Abba, here, meaning father in Aramaic. Right? So Barabbas is the son of the father, uh, which in some sense means nothing. <laughs> which father yeah. are you referring to? Are you referring to God the father or just a random father? So there are some commentators who think that Barabbas is actually a pseudonym. Uh, we don't actually know that the real name of whoever this person was, Mark has decided not to give us his real name. He's just called Barabbas. However, some think that he really is named Barabbas. Either way, it serves what Mark wants to do in this story. Um, So we learn about Barabbas who according to Mark, is in prison for an insurrection. We also don't know what insurrection he's talking about. Uh, Mark doesn't give us enough detail to find out uh, historically in other documents uh, which uprising this was. Um, But he's in prison for this, and there is some suspicion or at least some theories from biblical scholars that two rebels that we're going to see later in this story may have been a part of the insurrection with Barabbas. So all three of them should have been put up on the cross and killed. Um, But Jesus, of course, takes Barabbas's place. So the crowd gets riled up by the um, chief priests, and they ask for Barabbas's release, much to the dismay of Pilate. He's thinking, the crowds, they've been hanging out with Jesus. They like Jesus. So they're, they're going to want to release Jesus, and that's going to gain me a little bit of credit with the people. So he asks, do you want me to release the king of the Jews? No, crucify him. We want Barabbas. So his questions turn from this hint of sarcasm with king of the Jews to now surprise When he goes, well, what shall I do with the one you call the king of the Jews? Crucify him. Verse 14, it turns from, he's no longer being sarcastic. He's genuinely shocked. Why? He hasn't done anything. They're just setting him up. He hasn't committed any crimes. But they shouted all the more, crucify him. And so in verse 15, wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate releases Barabbas to them. So either way, he wants to satisfy the crowd so he can get in good with them, but it goes in a direction that he 
did not intend <laughs> unintentionally releasing an actually very dangerous man in Barabbas. But he sends Jesus off to be flogged, which is a, a style of whipping uh, where they take leather and on the ends of the leather, they'd tie sharp objects like rocks or glass or whatever and whip the back of whoever that they were flogging. Um, and then he's handed over to be crucified. A um, couple of other things here that I, I want to point out. Um, so uh, the play with Barabbas, the son of the father, uh, that Mark is making here is is really ingenious writing on Mark's part. Uh, Barabbas, who is an actual insurrectionist, is an actual rebel, is an actual murderer, gets released. And the one that's being accused of all of those things, Jesus, but has done none of them, is the one who ends up paying the penalty here. Uh, one uh, scholar wrote it this way. One son of the father, Barabbas then, has tried to in vain usher in the heavenly Abba's dominion through revolutionary violence against the Romans. The other succeeds in doing so by dying on a Roman cross. Um, so it's very intentional that Mark wants us to compare Barabbas, the son of the father, to Jesus, the son of the father. Does that make sense? Okay, a uh, couple of words here also that I want to point out to you in Greek. The word hikanon is the word satisfy in verse 15. Um, we've seen a word translated as satisfy before in the feeding stories. You recall that? But it's a totally different word. Mark intentionally uses two different words here to depict the way that Jesus, Jesus satisfies to the fullest. In fact, the, that word uh, is often used to describe being full in your belly, as in you ate well, uh, but it was also used to describe that not only did they eat well, like the, all their true desires have been filled. Whereas this word, hikanon, is more like, it was enough. It was okay. It was sufficient. In other words, Jesus has the ability to satisfy the deep longings. And Pilate's attempt, it's just okay. It's sufficient. So a, a play on words here uh, that's really brilliant from Mark. And then another word that has been actually popping up throughout Mark's text, and I can't recall if I went over this word. Have you seen, do you remember this word, paradidomai? Actually, um, I keep misspelling. I think it can be spelled paradidomai or paradidomi. Um, my word study had it as paradidomi today. Um, it means to be handed over. Uh, this word has been used many times already in Mark. Um, so in the betrayal story, uh, this word gets used when Judas betrays Jesus and he's handed over to the Roman guards, the soldiers. Um, and and then gets used again here in verse 15, hands him over to be crucified. It's a, a way Mark multiple times throughout his gospel speaks in um, passive terms to describe how Jesus is not resisting any of this. He's allowing it all to happen. But it seems like there are forces at work behind the characters. In other words, spiritual forces at work that are enacting all of these events. The question is, which spiritual forces are they? And I want to make an argument that in some ways it's a combination of the evil spiritual forces and God the Father. 
the evil spiritual forces are trying to get Jesus killed because they recognize that he is a threat to them and their well-being. But God is okay with this because he knows that he can use it for his ends. In other words, Jesus is going to go to the cross, which seems like the demons and the evil spirits are winning, but God is going to flip that on its end for his own purposes. And all of this is being conveyed in this one Greek word, paradidomi which happens over and over again in Mark. Yeah. James, what's another translation of where when Jesus replies to Pilate, you have said so. What does that really mean? Like, you're right, or so you say, or yep. mm -hmm. maybe, maybe not, or I mean like... Stronger than maybe, maybe not, more like, as you have said, so there is a... So kind of validating it. Yeah, but a kind of wink-wink way. Like, I mean, you're the one saying it, not me. Okay. That sort of sense. You're the one who called me king of the Jews. So am I? May, there may even be a kind of a question there at the end. But certainly, um, certainly more than maybe. St stronger than that. Definitely the sense of... I mean, you're the one. You're the one speaking it. No, I didn't say anything. You think Pilate believed it? I think he means the question very sarcastically, certainly at first. So I don't think he thinks that Jesus is King of the Jews. I think he thinks that this is all just some one of those Jewish religious leader conflicts again. So that's Herod. Yeah, yeah. So we got a couple different yeah, a couple different people here. Herod is Jewish, so he's he's a puppet king of the area. Pilate is a Roman, um, so he's really in some ways more powerful than Herod, but it, but the power is kind of uh, I wouldn't say equal. Um, it's different. Yeah, there's a balance of power there. It's a way the Romans would make people think that they have some power so that they would acquiesce to what the Romans really wanted, um, even though the Romans were really the ones in charge. It's like when you're a parent and you have a kid who's misbehaving and then you give them the ability, the choice to make some certain decisions because you know that that is going to be the edge that you need to get them to do what you really want. Does that make sense? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. So, so why did they take, take Jesus to Pilate instead of Herod? And is the arrangement that if, if the, the Jewish religious leaders say somebody needs to be killed, Pilate just goes, oh, okay, I'll do it. I, I don't understand the arrangement. Yeah, yeah, good question. So they go to Pilate because Pilate's the, the one that has the authority to crucify. Herod does not. So because Pilate is the real Roman leader in the area, and Herod is more of a farcical leader. I mean, he does have some power, but, but not to the extent that Pilate does militarily. Um, some of it is political for Pilate. Right? He, he recognizes his main job is to keep insurrections from happening. And if he senses that he can gain some favor with the crowd in general, the people in general, then he's going to move in that direction to help keep order and stability. And that's part of what's playing out here. On the opposite side, if he makes a poor decision and they get riled up, then it's more likely that they have an uprising against the Romans, which the makes things Gospels. tricky f for him. Isn't there in one of the Gospels where they send him to Herod and Herod sends him back? 
Yeah. Yep. It's not here. Correct. Okay. Yep. As far as Mark is concerned, it's straight to Pilate. And this is typical of Mark. He just skips a lot of the details that other so Gospels include. First? No, he went to Pilate first, then Herod. I can't remember the order. Yeah. Yeah. Does that answer your question, Mike? Yeah. Well, yes and no. I mean, I, I guess I don't, <laughs> unfortunately, being stuck in the legal business, I, I don't. <laughs> It doesn't make a lot of sense to me that they can just go to Pilate and say, uh, crucify him, and Pilate goes, oh, okay, yeah. why it, not? And, and biblical scholars wrestle with it too, because there actually isn't a whole lot of historical evidence outside of the Bible for an arrangement like this. Um, however, at the same time, because all four of the Gospels seem to indicate that this sort of thing happens. There's arguments on the other side that say, well, I mean, it, these four are in agreement. Um, so, it, yeah, I think in some ways we, we have to kind of trust the biblical witness here as far as the political arrangements are concerned. Um, but certainly it is... It is a very questionable arrangement. It, it would cause you to think, I think, and probably correctly, Pilate is probably not the most upstanding leader. He, he can be easily corrupted and swayed um, to get what he wants. But Mark doesn't give us enough details about Pilate to know exactly what that would be other than trying to satisfy the crowd. Well, he was probably afraid of the crowd. Right. Yeah. yeah, right. Exactly. The commentary says that he was, uh, had problems before and he was worried about being uh, taken out of his job as the uh, head which, yeah, so good point, which actually does happen a few years later. I believe it's, your commentary may say, does it say, is it AD 37 that he gets fired, essentially? Um, I read it in mine. I'd have to go back and look. It's not long after this, though. Pilate gets canned. Uh, and, uh, in fact... It seems as though he actually has a pretty tight-knit relationship with the temple authorities because Caiaphas, the high priest, he gets canned right after Pilate does. Um, so, which maybe lends itself to this description I gave a moment ago to Mike that maybe there's some corruption happening uh, within the leadership structure of the Jewish religious authority and the Roman prefect. So, yeah, good point, Pat. Okay, let's move on. 16. We're actually going to read 16 through 32. So Jesus uh, has been flogged, and he's being handed over to be crucified, and then Mark tells us, "...the soldiers led Jesus away into the palace." that is, the praetorium, and called together the whole company of soldiers. They put a purple robe on him, then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on him. And they began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews! Again and again they struck him on the head with a staff and spit on him. Falling on their knees, they paid homage to him, and when they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Then they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it, and they crucified him. Dividing up his clothes, they cast lots to see what each would get. 
It was nine in the morning when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. They crucified two rebels with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, So, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him among themselves. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let this Messiah, this King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. And those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. All right. So this movement starts with being led out of the Sanhedrin to the palace. This is um, the prefect's palace, so Pilate's palace, where Jesus, uh, his torture begins. Uh, so the Praetorium, specifically, that, that is the name of Pilate's palace. It's pretty likely that the torture happens in the courtyard of the palace, not actually inside the house. Um, that would be very odd. Um, but the courtyard was fairly large. Um, it's also near the residence for much of the military, so it, they could quickly come and aid in the... Um, torture, and then the execution of Jesus. A couple of other things to note here. So purple robe, um, when you see the color purple in the Bible, that's generally a symbol of royalty. Um, so all the things that they do throughout this section are all to mock him. You claim to be a king, or people claim it for you, well, <laughs> what kind of king are you? They put a purple robe on him. They make a crown, but of course it's not just any crown. It's made of thorns, so more mockery, but also to be used towards torture. And then uh, they start beating him, and they're beating him with a kalamos. Which is a a reed made of, or a staff made of reeds. And it was commonly used by shepherds. It's also used as a measuring rod. So sometimes you'll see in the Bible places where people are doing measurements, they would use a rod, a long rod, kind of like a yardstick, um, and they'd put it down and then they'd flip it over and they'd flip it over and they'd flip it over and they'd count how long a thing was. Um, so the combination of the staff, um, which should convey the measuring, also the shepherding, is a sign of authority. Uh, so it's another way that they're mocking him. In the way a king would have a scepter, they're taking the scepter and beating him over the head with it. So they're, they're um, along with uh, the physical torture, um, you know, mocking him by, uh, you know, pledging their allegiance of sorts, but of course, mockingly, hail king of the Jews, um, spitting on him, falling on their knees to pay homage to him. But then they take off uh, his purple robe, put his own clothes back on, and they let him out to be crucified. So there are a lot of, uh, if you've ever seen uh, a movie or a show depicting the crucifixion of Jesus, there's a lot of different ways that these movies and shows have depicted this scene where Jesus goes from being tortured to up on a cross. And some of them, he's got this huge, massive cross that he's carrying the whole way. 
on his own. Um, then, of course, as Mark points out, but not every gospel, Simon of um, Cyrene comes along. They force him to carry it. What we do know is that commonly the Romans would force their executionees to carry the cross beam of the cross, not typically the whole cross. Um, so the crosses were set up in one of three ways. Um, so they had crosses that were actually in the shape of a T, and so the cross beam would be at the top. Uh, they also have crosses that probably the ones that are more familiar to us, um, more of a lowercase t, and the, the cross beam would either fit into some grooves on the pole, or they, they'd have some sort of way to fashion it up there. Um, and then apparently, and this was new information to me, um, there are times uh, that they've used X's, so the, yeah, so they'd be executed diagonally. Didn't they use that one a lot to uh, crucify them upside down? Yeah. That could be. That could be. Yeah. Which we know, by the way, the Apostle Peter was crucified upside down. Yeah. Yeah. So, three different styles. Um, Mark doesn't tell us. In fact, none of the Gospels really tell us which of these styles that he was crucified with. However, it is likely that he carried the cross beam. So just this part or one of these, at least for a little while until Simon comes along. If they put a uh, sign on the top of it though, it would have to be a cross like that because it wouldn't fit on the other one. Correct. Um, but as far as Mark is concerned, we don't know where the sign is actually placed. So they almost always put signs on uh, those who are being executed, but it would be in one of two places. So they could hang it around the neck of the person being executed, or as Pat said, they'd hang it on the cross. If they were going to put it above, then yes, you would need uh, one of this style. But sometimes they'd put the placard below as well. Um, it just it seems like it's kind of random uh, the way that they place the placards on. Um, no rules for the cross. <laughs> I mean, some rules, but yes, uh, some freedom given to those doing the executions, and and it probably depends on where they're at um, because they do these not just in Jerusalem. I mean, all over. Um, so there's probably different styles within different places where the Romans were doing these sorts of executions. The commentary says the replaced card was then fastened to the cross above his head. Yeah, that's, a, that's an interpretive move that your commentary is making. Mark doesn't actually say that outright, but it, it's very common and very possible that it would have been put over his head. And other Gospels do make it sound like that's the case. Um, so sometimes what commentary writers will do is based on what another gospel will say, they'll say, oh, that, that writer said it was above his head, so that, that must be where it was. And Mark just didn't give us that detail. I just want to be hesitant to go that far, although I, I am going to do that in just a little bit. Uh, <laughs> so hold on. <laughs> Yeah. 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 And that's, again, another interpretive move that they're making. Okay. So they, he has the cross beam, and uh, Simon comes along to help him, uh, not willingly, of course. Um, and they take him to Golgotha, which Mark has been so helpful in defining the Aramaic words, um, because this definitely does mean place of the skull. The question is, why is it called place of the skull? Uh, and, and really there's two 
common theories. One is that it's called the place of the skull because it's the place where they do all these executions. Um, the other theory is that this is kind of a hill, a, a rocky area. In fact, um, maybe a quarry of sorts. And they thought that it could be the case that the area looked like a skull. Um, but we don't know. You want a third choice? Sure, give us a third <laughs> choice, given what the Passion says. The Passion Bible says, the Aramaic word is Golgotha. This is Calvaria in Latin, or Calvary. David took Goliath's head. Goliath and Golgotha are taken from the same root word and buried it outside of Jerusalem in 1 Samuel 17.54, and some believe this is where the hill got its name. And that's a really good theory that I didn't read. So I'm glad you're here today. <laughs> In my yeah. idea, I just read it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So there you go. Three possibilities for Golgotha, why it's called that. Okay. So they get to Golgotha, and they get him up on the cross, and then immediately they... Actually, uh, verse 23 is technically up before he's up on the cross, because that's on verse 24. So he's about to go up, and they offer him wine mixed with myrrh. And a couple different theories about what that is or why that is. So one theory is that it's a sedative um, that he then refuses. Another theory is that it looks good to drink, but the, the myrrh makes it undrinkable. So for someone who's so thirsty already, it's another way of mocking them and torturing them. Uh, here's a drink, and they immediately spit it out, and they get thirstier. Uh, again, not 100% sure. Um, maybe Mike has a third option. Okay. <laughs> uh, but certainly, it, uh, Jesus... Um, turns it down, and it probably is should be read as some sort of either thing to mock him or another way of torturing him. Um, so then we get to verse 24. He's up on the cross. And from this point on, we should see echoes of Psalm 22 throughout the story. And I actually want to flip to Psalm 22 um, so that you have in your mind... all of the images that that psalm conveys and the way that Mark utilizes those images in telling the story of Jesus' crucifixion. It starts this way. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? My God, I cry out by day, but... You do not answer by night, but I find no rest. Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the one Israel praises. In you our ancestors put their trust. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried out and were saved. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by everyone, despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. Yet you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you, even at my mother's breast. From birth I was cast on you. From my mother's womb you have been my God. So do not be far from me, for trouble is near and there is no one to help. Many bulls surround me, strong bulls of Bashan encircle me, roaring lions that tear their prey open, their mouths wide against me. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax, it has melted within me. My mouth is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death." Dogs surround me. A pack of villains encircles me. They pierce my hands and my feet. All my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. 
But you, Lord, do not be far from me. You are my strength. Come quickly to help me. Deliver me from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dogs. Rescue me from the mouth of the lions. Save me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will declare your name to my people. In the assembly, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel. For he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. From you comes the theme of my praise in the great assembly. Before those who fear you, I will fulfill my vows. The poor will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations will bow down before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. All the rich of the earth will feast and worship. All who go down to the dust will kneel before him, those who cannot keep themselves alive. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will, pro- they will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn, he has done it. So you should, especially if you already read through 15 and 16 prior to the night, but you're going to see it again here in a moment, ways in which those images of Psalm 22 make their way into this story. The hurling of insults, the, the um, taking of his clothes and casting lots for them, um, the sense of being surrounded by enemies, which in that moment Jesus certainly is. Um, and he cries out to God, to save him, will God do so? We'll find out as we continue along. Uh, one other note. Um, so the Praetorium is actually fairly close to Golgotha. Um, it's about a thousand feet, give or take. Um, so the journey that Jesus takes from the Praetorium to Golgotha is about you know, a little less than a quarter of a mile. As Mark uh, continues to tell this story, he does so in a pretty orderly way, and he specifically notes the time frames in which things are happening. We've actually already skipped a couple, but they're just a little bit tricky to be able to write notes on. Um, So we'll start here at the third hour. It's what the NIV translates as 9 a.m. This is another instance where the NIV makes an interpretive move in saying that it's 9 a.m., which it it likely is because in this area of the world, um, time doesn't fluctuate nearly as much as it does here. We're further north, and so generally 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. is daylight time, 6 p.m., 6 a.m. is nighttime. That's a little overgeneralized, certainly, but that's the way that they typically thought about time in that culture. Um, so Mark breaks things into um, these three-hour periods. Um, so a lot of the torture that we've already happened that or already gone through that happened right at dawn, 6 a.m. ish. Um, this third hour is where he gets up onto the cross. Um, One other area, so we've already talked about some differences between um, Mark and other Gospels. If you pay close attention to John's telling of uh, of these events, he also marks the times, but there is a definite conflict Um, John says that certain things happen at different times than Mark does. So that's an area where some have 
ridiculed the Bible in the past saying, oh, they can't even agree on what time all this stuff happens. Uh, but those of us who have had any experience in law enforcement know that if there are differences in some of the details, that actually makes it more reliable, yes? yes. Right. Because if they're all the same, it's more likely that they made up the story, yep, they were talking things out together ahead of time. Okay, so this is actually a, a sense in which these are more reliable because they think about the details differently. I would also argue that they tell the details in the way that the authors want those details to be told. Mark is using this particular time frame to get a particular point across, which is this that despite all this ugliness, God is at work behind the scenes, orderly, uh, making an orderly move of the events leading up to this crucifixion. In other words, um, think back if you were in my Genesis class. Genesis chapter 1, the very first part of the Bible, the, the big emphasis of Genesis 1 is that God is a God of order and structure. And Mark is trying to convey that even in the midst of this chaos, God is still a God of order and structure um, in the way that these events take place. So, uh, verse... Let's see, what do I want to... Verse 27... I noted already that Psalm 22 is in the background of much of what we will read in the rest of chapter 15, uh, but there are other references that Mark is making as well. In uh, verse 27, where we find out that Jesus is crucified by two rebels, um, that calls to mind Isaiah chapter 53, verse 12, and that's where Isaiah says that the suffering servant is numbered with the transgressors. So you've got multiple echoes from the Old Testament happening all while these events are taking place. And then in, in 29 through 32, um, more echoes from Psalm 22, the hurling of insults, the shaking of heads. And then they cry out, you're going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, huh? Come down from the cross and save yourself. They recall the prediction of the temple destruction, and then they mockingly assumed that because Jesus is on the cross, there's no way that he can destroy the temple now, especially if he can't get off the cross. So in the same way, chief priests, they can continue to mock him. He saved others. He can't save himself, this king of Israel. Let's see if he comes down and they keep hurling insults at him. And then we get to verse 33. At noon, so we've got another time frame. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three, well, there's the next time frame, three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lema shabachthani, which, me, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Again, Psalm 22. When some of those standing near heard this, they said, Hey, listen, he's calling Elijah. Someone ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar, put it on a staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. And with a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, Surely this man was the Son of God. Some women were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the younger, and of Joseph, and Salome. In Galilee, these women had followed him and cared for his needs. 
Many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem were also there. I'm going to keep reading till the end of this chapter. It was preparation day, that is the day before the Sabbath. So as evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Pilate was surprised to hear that he was already dead. Summoning the centurion, he asked him if Jesus had already died. When he learned from the centurion that it was so, he gave the body to Joseph. So Joseph bought some linen cloth, took down the body, wrapped it in the linen, and placed it in a tomb cut out of the rock. Then he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. So at the beginning of this section, we have our our next indicator of the time frame. So again, there's an interpretive move here to say that this is at noon, but literally the Greek is sixth hour. And then darkness consumes all of the land until the next time period, three in the afternoon, or as it says in the Greek, or enades, so the ninth hour. There's been a lot of speculation about what causes the darkness that's mentioned here. Some have speculated that there's this huge cloud of dust or smoke that um, covers up the sun. Others have speculated an eclipse. Um, the, The truth is none of those naturalistic explanations are really all that sufficient. I think it's more helpful for us to think supernaturally and again turn our attention to the Old Testament where in Amos chapter 8, verses 9 and 10, uh, there is a great darkness that is prophesied that falls upon the land, and it is a sign of God's judgment of the cosmos. And I think that's exactly what Mark is trying to convey here, that in Jesus' death, God is enacting the day of the Lord the judgment that was prophesied. In particular, the Jewish authorities are being judged, although there'll be another um, emphasis of that in a moment. Um, But because the darkness covers, as um, the NIV says, the whole land, some translations say the whole earth until three in the afternoon, I think it's right to read that as this is judgment of everything. All of humanity, all of the cosmos, God is enacting judgment through Jesus' death. And then, at three in the afternoon, Jesus cries out in Aramaic, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So, direct quote of the first verse of Psalm chapter 22. Meanwhile, some people standing around hear him cry this out, and mistakenly think, oh, he's crying out to Elijah. So it seems as though, we've actually kind of covered this already, uh, there was an idea that Elijah would come right before the day of judgment, that he was a precursor that would prepare the way for that. But Mark has already told us that that has happened through John the Baptist, right? Uh, So they are mistaken in, oh, maybe he's crying out for Elijah. Well, from Jesus and Mark perspective, Elijah's already shown up, and he's already out of the picture. That's already been taken care of. So they, they think they hear Elijah, but they are mistaken. It's another way, and Mark is portraying how people are blind. They are not really seeing what is actually going on here. And so someone fills a sponge with wine vinegar 
um, to give to Jesus to drink. Um, now, in this one, we don't actually know whether he drinks it or not. And we're not really sure why the wine vinegar. Um, in fact, there's a debate amongst scholars. Are they being kind this time? Or is this another way of mocking him? But once again, this is actually predicted in Psalm 69, verse 20 and 21, that the one suffering would uh, be given wine vinegar to drink. So it's another way that Mark is saying all of these prophecies about the Messiah are being predicted um, as these events play out. So then with a, a loud cry, uh, Jesus breathes his last. And then there's a, a shift in, in the scenery of the narrative. Um, it goes from Golgotha to the temple. And in the temple, we actually have two different um, possible curtains that could have been torn. Um, so there was a curtain that went from inside. Let's actually, let's draw some more. How about that? <laughs> so here's the whole temple. Inside, you have the, the main building of the temple. And inside of the temple, you have the Holy of Holies. So this is a courtyard out here. Then inside the building here, Holy of Holies here. There's a curtain right here separating the sanctuary from the courtyard and then there's another one inside separating the sanctuary from the holy of holies mark doesn't tell us which of the curtains tear in two but the idea is going to be the same no matter which one it is um, and no matter what it's impressive because these are are no teeny curtains these are massive beasts of curtains uh, we're pretty confident that the um, one inside, so the sanctuary, separating the sanctuary from the Holy of Holies, was 32 feet high. And the curtain between the sanctuary and the courtyard, the outer one, was 82 feet high. So that's a massive beast of a curtain. Ain't, you ain't just going <laughs> with a curtain like that, right? No human is doing that. On their own. It is very explicitly an act of God that the curtain is being torn in two. And it's another sign of judgment. This is the one that I was saying is specifically an act of judgment against the religious leadership and the temple. But it's also a sign of how God's presence is being set loose from the temple and is being um, spread throughout the world through Jesus and his followers. Now, in the moment, we think, well, Jesus is dead. So that's not going to spread very far. But Mark wants us to have in mind where this narrative is going, that, that Jesus isn't going to stay dead, that he's going to resurrect. And in light of his resurrection, the Spirit of God will spread through the followers of Jesus throughout the world. And it's in this scene that we then shift back to Golgotha and verse 39. When Jesus dies, a centurion, okay, not a Jewish person, a Roman military lackey, essentially, he recognizes in Jesus' death that he is the son of of God, which is very noteworthy for Mark. Mark has been pointing us to the death of Jesus over and over and over and over and over again. He really thinks theologically the death of Jesus is the most important aspect of the whole Jesus story, more so than the resurrection. Not that the resurrection is not important. It is. But the death is where we see the true identity of Jesus, and it's there that a Gentile in Jesus' death, somehow recognizes, oh, this really is the Son of God. His death is transformative 
for this man's life. And then, immediately, Mark starts describing some women who are watching. And he has not told us about these women up to this point. But all of a sudden, we find out these women have been tagging along this whole time. They've actually been caring for his needs. And then he decides to name them right there. Why would he do this? Well, it's, it's actually pretty scandalous. In, in Jewish world at this time, um, women had very little rights. And one of the rights they did not have was the right to make accusations in court. Um, so let's say, let's say um, Nathan stole this piece of paper from me, but I didn't know. But Pat sees this happen. If we're living in the ancient Jewish world of this time, Pat could not be a witness to this event. She would not be allowed in the court to be able to, even though she saw it happen plain as day, she knows where Nathan's keeping it in his back pocket. Doesn't matter. In that society, um, women were regarded as um, untrustworthy when it came to these sorts of matters. Couldn't she testify if she had two collaborating witnesses, or am I thinking about something else? The men have to have two witnesses. Okay. Yeah. So Mark decides we're going to go over the top in telling you how many witnesses there are. There is at least three. We've got Mary Magdalene. We've got Mary, the mother of Joseph and James, and we've got Salome. Uh, but it's telling because, as I mentioned, the, the witness of women was not regarded as trustworthy in the ancient world. So for Mark to even tell us that there were women there, much less that stay in the narrative, is pretty scandalous. And it's another reason why biblical scholars think this is legitimate. Because no one who's just trying to plot out a, um, like the best way to convince people that Jesus came back from the dead, no one would have written that it was a bunch of women who saw it first. They would have said it was men, and probably upstanding men in the society. So it's another way that God's kingdom enacted in Jesus is very upside down, very countercultural, that women and their witness is what sparks the news of Jesus' resurrection. I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but... No, 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 no. <laughs> okay. Good. Okay. The other, the other aspect of the upside-down kingdom is that this is a culture not unlike our own that is very male-dominant, and yet this story tells us that all the men... Ran for the hill. But all the, the but the his other followers, all women, stayed there. Yes. Uh, yeah. Not in Mark's gospel, but in other ones. Yeah. In John's, I suspect. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, who are these three women? Um, which is because it's fascinating that now he names them, and he's going to name them three times over the next few, few verses. There's not a lot of Mark left. Okay? So we've got Mary Magdalene. Um, the Greek uh, for Mary is Maria. And Maria... <laughs> Maria actually means rebellious. It does, it does. Which is funny because there's actually, there's Mary Magdalene. There's another Mary in just a moment. Mary, the mother of Jesus. Uh, we're going to get to whether or not this other Mary is Mary, the mother of Jesus. Um, some think she is. Well, I'll just get to it now because I'm already on it. Uh, 
Some think that she is. Others are not so sure. Um, they think that she could be the mom of James, son of Alphaeus, uh, one of Jesus' disciples. But we, Mark doesn't give us enough information to tell us. Give us another one. <laughs> give us another one. The Passion Bible says Mary, the mother of Jacob the Younger, and Joseph. Yeah, so actually Jacob and James uh, are the same name okay. in Greek. Uh, James comes from the Greek, Jacob. Uh, Greek doesn't have J's in it, by the way. I can't remember if we've gone over that or not. But, yeah. Yeah, so your passion translation is just telling you what we already know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So, yeah, we're not really sure which Mary that is as far as Mark is concerned. Um, oh, anyway, my point about Marys, uh, Marias. Uh, so uh, we got Mary, the mother of Jesus, um, assuming that it's a different person than Mary, the mother of James and Joseph. We have Mary Magdalene. Um, in the Old Testament, there's another Maria who is a very prominent figure, um, but her name in from Hebrew to English, gets translated as Miriam. It's Moses' sister. But all of, the, all of those names all mean rebel. So they should all be read kind of tongue-in-cheek. They're all, all of these women you think are going to be rebellious, which, by the way, Miriam uh, does act rebelliously at times. Um, all of them have a very prominent place in the story of God, both the Jewish story and the Jesus story, certainly the Jesus story, because we got a lot of Marys. So you think these people are going to be rebellious, and yet they end up playing an important role in what's going on. And then you have Salome, and again, we're not exactly sure who this is, but it's very likely that it is the wife of Zebedee, um, so the mother of James and John. And her name, Salome, comes from the Greek word, or the Hebrew word shalom, which means peace or peaceful. Peaceful <laughs> yeah, peaceful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, you should see that. You should see it that way. Yeah, because in many ways, that's what Jesus is doing. And that's what the women are doing, too. That's exactly right. Um, yeah, anyway, um, we're, we're more confident of Salome because Matthew 27 says that Salome is James and John's mother. So again, Mark doesn't say it, but this is a case where it's worthwhile to trust Matthew, I think. So these women are... Um, observing all of this happening. And then we find out that this is preparation day. In other words, it's Friday, the day before the Sabbath. So as evening approach, um, Joseph of Arimathea, he um, volunteers to take care of Jesus' body. So in Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 23, there's a... Um, an instruction from God that when folks die, they have to be buried before sundown. So uh, Joseph is interpreting this literally, and so he's like, we got to get Jesus' body taken care of. We only have three hours to do this, because remember, he dies at three in the afternoon, the ninth hour, and the twelfth hour is when sundown happens. And so as you read through the rest of the description of Joseph taking down his body and wrapping him up, you should read a very hurried pace. He does the, the very minimum to get Jesus' body prepared and then put in the tomb. But of course, leading up to that, Joseph has to get the body in the first place. So he goes to Pilate says, can I have Jesus' body? And Pilate's first reaction is, he's dead already? And he's not convinced by this. It, 
actually makes sense. Crucifixions were meant to be excruciatingly long because more than an execution device, they were meant to show the rest of the people, this is what happens when you cross us. And so it's meant to be a spectacle that lasts a very long time. So Pilate's actually surprised that Jesus has already died. So he has to check with one of his guards who confirms the story so that then Joseph can take his body, get him prepared quickly, and then put into the tomb. Meanwhile, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw all of this happen. So they see where he's laid and then decide to do something to honor him, which is what we find in chapter 16. Pat, you have a, a comment before we move yes, on? The, the, the commentary says that sometimes it took two or three days for them to die. You're right. Right, yep, yep. So for it to have only been a matter of hours was quite quick. Yep. So verse... Sorry, chapter 16. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very, very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. And that's how Mark's gospel ends. <laughs> well, kind of. Uh, we're going to get to that in a minute. But first, these first eight verses. So they buy spices, the three women, uh, to go and honor his body. It was common that you would put spices over um, the very body to honor them. So they assume that he's dead. So they go the day after the Sabbath, which is the first day that they can even go to a market, much less the first day that would be socially acceptable for them to go to the tomb. Uh, so they go get spices, they head off to the tomb. On the way, they think, oh yeah, there's a big stone in front of the tomb. Don't know exactly how big the stone is, but it was pretty common for them to be about a meter, so about three feet wide. Um, so it's actually smaller than some of the depictions that we get in media now. Um, even this last Easter with our little cave and stone over there a little bit bigger than most likely what it was um, what they would do is they'd find these clefts in the rocks usually just wide enough to be able to get bodies into them um, and so they they maybe dig out the hole a little bit and then they would get a rock to cover just the size of that hole so the caves as it were uh, probably weren't super large. Um, that being said, uh, for three women, um, a stone that's about three feet wide is probably going to be pretty heavy, so it would have been difficult for them to move. doesn't matter. They, they're going along, and they anablepo. We've seen that word before. Y'all remember what that word means? Anyone remember? He looked up. They're, sorry, they look up. Remember, we learned it's not just that they physically look up. It's also like a, 
whoa, this is a very significant event that they are witnessing, something striking that they need to take notice of. So they anableppo, and the stone has been rolled away. And so they go to the tomb, and in there is a young man. Where have I heard about a young man before? Oh, in chapter 14, who's running away naked? There's a young man. So some scholars are su suggest that the two young men are one and the same. That the young man running away, losing his clothes, is the same young man who appears in the tomb, this time clothed. And part of the point then in that theory is that in Jesus' death and resurrection, he has, his shame has been taken away. And so the clothes represent the covering of that shame, just like with Adam and Eve. Right? So he's there in the tomb, and the women are like, uh, you're not Jesus. And he said, yeah, Jesus, the Nazarene, shout out Nazarenes, uh, he's not here. He's risen. See, this is the place where they laid him. So go and tell his disciples. And note that he says disciples and Peter. Why would he single out Peter? Because he specifically denies Jesus three times. So it's a way of, yep, re-entering him into the community. Reassure him that he can still be a part of this. So Jesus is going to go ahead of you into Galilee, your home, and there you will see him. <laughs> so then Mark says, the women are trembling and bewildered, and they went out and they flee, and they say nothing to anyone because they were afraid. <laughs> and that's how Mark ends. Nobody anyway. Right. <laughs> well, that's true. Let's think about this also in terms of Mark. Throughout Mark, Jesus has told people, don't tell anybody about me. And they all, almost all of them, blab about it. So in this time where they're instructed, go and tell everybody, they keep quiet. But wink, wink, they don't actually keep quiet, do they? How do we know that? Because we have this book. Yeah. Right. We wouldn't have Mark if it weren't for the fact that they had to have told somebody. The question then is who? They, they had to have said something to someone. And I think there's some good biblical evidence that um, some phrasing that's being used in verse 8 suggests that a way that it probably could be read was they said nothing to anyone except for the disciples and Peter. In other words, the people they were supposed to tell. Um, because there's a very similar phrasing a couple of times in Mark. And in both of those instances, someone is told not to say something to some, to like a general group of people with the exception of a person. Um, so I think that's, that's a very likely thing that's happening here as well. Now, so, so as we read it right now, 16 ends at verse 8. However, throughout most of Christian history, it has not ended at verse 8. We actually have two what we now would consider to be alternative endings and we would consider them alternative endings because, based on um, the extent of archaeological work that has been done over the last 100 to 150 years, the oldest manuscripts that we have of Mark end at verse 8. But we have multiple manuscripts that are a little bit newer that end in one of three ways. So either at the end of 8 
Or they add in a, an additional verse, verse 9, which reads this way, Then they quickly reported all these instructions to those around Peter, which, by the way, that backs up the theory that I just said about them going to tell Peter and those around Peter, the disciples. After this, Jesus himself also sent out through them from east to west the sacred and imperishable proclamation of eternal salvation. Amen. So that's one alternate ending that are in some of the newer texts. And by new, I mean like the second century AD. So like, they're still pretty old. Um, and then one other alternate ending, and this has probably been the more, more common alternate ending, and it's the one that I actually have in full in the NIV. Many of yours probably have it as well, but probably italicized or with some sort of note that says that 9 through 20 uh, don't appear in the most ancient manuscripts. Um, 9 through 20 read this way. When Jesus rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had driven seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him and who were mourning and weeping. When they heard that Jesus was alive and that she had seen him, they did not believe it. Afterward, Jesus appeared in a different form to two of them while they were walking in the country. These returned and reported it to the rest, but they did not believe them either. Later, Jesus appeared to the eleven as they were eating. He rebuked them for their lack of faith and their stubborn refusal to believe those who had seen him after he had risen. He said to them, Go into the, all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will drive out demons, they will speak in new tongues, they will pick up snakes with their hands, and when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on sick people, and they will get well. After the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was taken up into heaven, and he sat at the right hand of God. Then the disciples went out and preached everywhere, and the Lord worked with them and confirmed his word by the signs that accompanied it. So when we read through 9 through 20, that longer alternative ending, in some ways we should be kind of jarred by it. Um, and as part of why now most scholars don't include 9 through 20 in Mark's gospel, because the writing style, first of all, is very different than the way that Mark typically writes. Um, also, the things that are depicted here are different than the way Mark has been depicting things, especially since Mark chapter 11. Um, he, uh, 9 through 20 notes ways in which um, followers of Jesus will have all of these signs accompanying them, right? Driving out demons, speaking in new tongues, picking up snakes with their hands, that's weird, um, and drinking deadly poison, and it doesn't hurt them, also strange, and then placing their hands on the sick, and they get well. We have some bits and pieces of that happening in the early parts of Mark through Jesus and through his disciples. But for Mark, especially as we get toward the end, the signs are not as big of a deal for Mark. In fact, multiple times people ask Jesus for a sign. Give us a sign. Where's the signs? And there are no signs. It's his death that is the sign. So it would seem odd in some ways that Mark has made such a big deal out of his death and that being the sign that then he would say, here's all these signs, picking up snakes and blah, 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 blah and all sorts of other things odd things. So it's another reason why we think mm, this probably isn't original to Mark. Also note that the things that are mentioned in 9 through 20 are all things that come from other Gospels. So all other Gospels mention um, Jesus visiting with um, Mary Magdalene. In fact, Luke is the one who says that she has seven demons. Um, he appears, uh, it's also in Luke, where he appears to two of them while they're walking. 
Um, and then again, appearing to 11. Um, that happens in John as well as in Luke. And then verse 15, go into all the world. This is essentially the Great Commission at the end of Matthew chapter 28. Um, and Acts also records a similar um, thing. And then a lot of these signs that we see uh, are things that Christians do in the New Testament. In Acts, it happens. In fact, every one of these happens. Um, uh, Paul gets bitten by a snake um, and does not die um, and is able to handle the snake. Um, and there's multiple stories throughout um, ancient um, Christian texts that are not in the Bible about how Christians are able to pray for people who are sick and they get well and they speak in tongues and on and on and on. So you, so you do have hints coming from multiple biblical sources. So it seems as though someone was reading along in Mark and knew some of these other biblical sources and was like, this isn't a good ending. Let's include some other stuff that we know from these other sources. Yeah, exactly. And so that that's probably, again, we're speculating a little bit, but it's probably how we get 9 through 20 the way that we do. Okay. So a little bit odd to end a biblical book with three different endings, uh, and yet here we are. So um, my so what question is this. Um, given that we're pretty confident verse 8 is actually the end of Mark, we have kind of an odd ending, right? They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. So how should we think about and then live out the way Mark conveys the end of his gospel? Especially given what I said about how, wink, wink, they didn't actually keep it to themselves. We know they told people. So what is the implication for us? Yeah. In fact, the way it's written, it's almost as if Mark is writing us into the story. Right? That Jesus is resurrected, and these women have this news. They're running away afraid. Wink, wink, they keep telling it. Wink, wink, we should too. Even when we're afraid. Even when we're concerned about how it would look. Even when we're going to be ridiculed in our own culture and society. Not going to be the same that the women of that society would have been, but ridicule does happen. And then a certainly... Um, because we're confident that many of Mark's early readers were being persecuted, that in the face of persecution, we still continue to proclaim the good news of Jesus, because it certainly is good news. Any other things that pop into your mind from what we've covered tonight or what we've covered throughout this series that you think is worthwhile to hold on to um, and to live out in our own world today. I have a question. Jennifer, go for it. An observation. Yep. So did the women go back and to anoint Jesus' body because Joseph didn't have time to? Or was okay. So it was Providence after the, the next day. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But my observation that I think is really cool was back in verse 38 um, when the curtain was torn. Mm -hmm. Not the judgment side of it, but the allowing of God's presence. And right away, the centurion acknowledges. Oh, right. And so he's like the first convert. Yep. <laughs> I think that's so cool. As far as Mark is concerned, yeah. Right. At least the first convert post crucifixion. Because you have all these ones. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Note that Mark doesn't mention that, right? Yeah. They're just two robbers. He does. But it's because the, that those details don't matter for his telling of the story. He wants, to, he wants us to see the innocent one is being surrounded by two rebels who were part of an insurrection. They're deserving of death, but Jesus is not. By the way, 
uh, James and John ask to be on Jesus's right and his left. And that's not for me to give, Jesus says. And who ends up there instead? Two rebels. And I found the part where they go to Pilate first and he pawns him off on Herod. He's like, oh, he's Herod's jurisdiction. Uh -huh. Then Herod's like, he's got the consensus to crucify him, but has to send him back to Pilate for that edict or whatever. Yeah. And in, in, in Luke it says, that day Herod and Pilate became friends. Before this they had been enemies. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. For a while. Yeah. yeah. And fascinating because Mark, you want Mark is conveying some of this in the background, the sense in which the Jewish religious leaders and the Romans who should be at odds, they come together to crucify Jesus. Right? The enemy of my enemy is my friend, essentially. Uh, but but the way Mark conveys it is not such they're not quite practical terms like that. It's their demonic forces, evil forces at work behind the scenes that drive them together to do this. And God uses it against them to turn things upside down through Jesus's death and resurrection. Yeah. Good observations. Anyone else? Mm-hmm. And when he died, the man's name was Joseph. Mm -hmm. The other thing is the king of the Jews, when I read that, it kind of hit with me, so I kind of looked it up. That only appears twice in the Bible, when Jesus was born and right before his death. Yep. And then you've got the Mary. She's the mother. She was there at the death. Yep. Well, and, and again, this is a way, multiple Gospels do this, but Mark is certainly doing this right at the beginning. He doesn't, <laughs> he, he, he isn't secretive about what he's trying to do. He's very clear from the beginning. This is about Jesus, who is the King, who is the Son of God, who is the good news and the one who announces it. Um, so each Gospel does that in different ways. Um, for Luke and Matthew, for example, they use genealogies and the birth narratives to describe Jesus' identity. That's not what Mark does. Mark essentially skips all the way to the baptism um, and then a few other things, along with his own um, explanation in the first verse. But yeah, they're all, they're all trying to get to his identity pretty quickly. Good observation. Anyone else? So, Carleen. because Mark, like in chapter one, after verse one, was very direct in saying that Jesus was. How long, do you know how long he lived after he wrote the book of Mark? Was he, was he martyred like many of the other um, disciples? That's a good question. And could it be because of what he wrote and was proclaiming Jesus was their true king? Yeah. I'm not sure on that. Okay. Um, if anyone has any notes in their Bible that say anything. Well, wasn't Mark um, a disciple? He wasn't originally. We don't think so. We think it was John Mark okay. who was a, a, a second generation follower of Jesus, but was part of Paul's missionary journeys. We're not 100% sure on that, but that's what the Christian tradition has said. And there's pretty good evidence that that's likely. So I'm not, not sure on that question. I want you to notice something. How often has Mark talked about sin in his gospel? Yeah. Why do you think that is? Yeah, but it doesn't even mention other people's sins. But who's the sin case the first time? And certainly there are sins happening. 
I'm just saying Mark doesn't outright say, he doesn't say the word sin, uh, and he doesn't claim that, he doesn't actually claim that Jesus saves people from their sins. Now, let me be clear, Jesus does save people from their sins. It's just not something that Mark is trying to emphasize. I think that's a really solid summary. I would also argue that that a summary of Mark can really be Yeah. Can really be tied to him as king. Look how often Mark either outright says or there's clear allusions to him being the king. And he means that in multiple ways. He means king of the Jews, in other words, the Messiah, the anointed one, but not a Messiah the way they think the Messiah should be. But he also means cosmic, the king of the universe, of everything for all time. And it is everywhere. And certainly, the Romans wouldn't have crucified him if they didn't think there was some sort of threat to their power. And who has the most power? A king. Do you want to know how Mark died? Tell us. Supposedly, he went back to Alexandria and tried to convert the people there. The pagans there didn't like it. This is a brief synopsis of what he just wrote. Yeah. Placed a rope around his neck and dragged him through the streets until he died. Ugh. That was Mark. That was Mark. Did it, when did it say when? The year 68. 68. So St. Mark the Evangelist. So the 68 after Jesus' death? Is that what that? No. 68? So it'd be 68 Ish. after he was born. After he was born. Uh, oh. So. So there's some theories, multiple theories about when Mark is written. The, the, the theory that says it was early was probably in the 40s A.D. The, the theory that it was later was in the 60s, in which case he would have written it and then died not long so after. In 49, 19 years after the ascension of Jesus, Mark traveled to Alexandria and founded the Church of Alexandria, which is now part of the Coptic Orthodox Church. That Alexandrian church was one of the hubs of Christianity in the ancient world. Alexandria, Antioch, and a couple of others were major, major uh, players in the growth of Christianity. Um, so that's a pretty significant place to have gone to and essentially started the ministry there. More on that in my church history class, yes. when that is to be determined. Uh, so while Mark focused on the kingdom, John steps in and talks about Jesus as a redeemer. Is and other, there are other, so there's some more philosophical aspects of John's gospel that aren't included in Matthew, Luke, and Mark. But yes, certainly redeemer motif and imagery. And it's not that that's not here, it is but it's not as prominent in Mark. Uh, Matthew's going to emphasize especially the Jewish Messiah aspect. Um, again, and there are others, other things that he emphasizes, but that's a big part. And Luke's going to emphasize that he is a king and advocate for the poor. Well, and then John 3.16 tells you how to get there. Yeah. But one of the reasons I wanted to bring that up is because sometimes we have a tendency in modern Christianity to really box in who Jesus is 
and what he does and died for, that he is Savior. And that's true. Jesus is Savior. But the Gospels and the New Testament want to show us much, much more, that he is king, that he is redeemer, that he is an advocate for those who are oppressed and in need, um, that he now sits at the right hand of the Father and is advocating for us on our behalf, um, that there's all of these different qualities and characteristics and aspects to who he is. And I fear that sometimes we narrow Jesus down to fit in our little box so that we can control the Jesus, right? And when we do that, that means that Jesus only applies to certain aspects of our lives. And that's not what the New Testament is trying to convey at all. It's trying to convey that he applies to every aspect of life. He should be the center of our lives and all of life for us should flow from him. Um, and that includes things that we don't often like to pair with Jesus. And, and for Mark, it's power. It's politics. Ugh, politics, right? But seriously, I mean... The way things are organized, and, and I'm, so I'm not just talking about how we think about politics as in Republican versus Democrat. I'm talking about the way we organize ourselves as human beings and how Jesus actually has something to say about that, and he is the leader of that. Um, and we can follow in his way and trust that when we do so, that the ways then that we interact with one another will be... Um, when we're following Jesus, will be good ways. They will be blessings to ourselves and others um, because they're marked by love, the, the greatest ethic of Christianity. So. One of the, the significant things to me, and has always been at the uh, death of Jesus, is the, uh, what happened to the curtain. Yeah. How that, how, how that, to me, it's just opened up a direct, from me, God. Yep. Uh, Else. Yep. Really powerful image. Very powerful. Yep. Great observation. Yep. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for participating in our Mark study. I really appreciated your thoughts, your comments, your questions. Um, and as I mentioned, the first week, we read Bible together. And we interpret together. That is what the church has always done, by the way, that we don't just figure this out by ourselves. This is a, a communal effort that we take part in, and we gain understanding by doing this together. So thank you for your contributions in helping us to do that and gain a greater understanding specifically of Mark, but of the Bible as a whole, and also, of course, of Jesus.